add my own welcome to all of you joining us for today's online conversation on reading in community with Matthew Lee Anderson and Anika Prather. I'd like to recognize and thank Baylor University and particularly the Baylor Honors Co uh, College and Baylor in Washington for co-hosting today's online conversation with us and to add my own thanks to our sponsors, Kevin and Chris Cherry and David and Lindsay Haynes for their generous support as well as the sustaining support of the Fetzer Institute for this series. We're delighted that so many of you are joining us today. I know we have around 1,200 people registered from, I think it's at least 18 different countries that we know of, ranging from Australia and Austria to Venezuela and Uganda. So a particular welcome to all of you who are first-time guests or international guests. Let us know where you're coming from. You can put that in the chat feature. It's always fun for us to get to see where, where people are tuning in from and a welcome from all of us across the miles and time zones. If you are one of those people joining us for the very first time or are new to the Trinity Forum, we work to cultivate, curate, and promote the best of Christian thought leadership and provide a place where leaders can wrestle with the big questions of life in the context of faith and come to better know the author of the answers. We hope this program will be a small taste of that for you today. Our topic today might seem a bit surprising or even counterintuitive. We tend to think of reading often as a solitary act. It's one that might beckon us to new worlds of imagination or partake in an ongoing conversation with authors from different lands or time. But particularly as adults, we tend to assume that that journey uh, is a solo one. But there's actually a great deal of evidence to suggest that reading in community offers possibilities, benefits, and joys even beyond those of reading in solitude, including enhanced comprehension, increased memory, greater enjoyment, and a much deeper sense of relationship and belonging. And since thinking itself is a deeply relational act, reading timeless works of great literature with others both broadens and deepens our own capacity to understand, interpret, and appreciate both a text content and characters and the content of our own character as well as that of our neighbor. And for those of us who worship the word, it invites us into new ways of knowing and loving our neighbor. It's an intriguing and exciting summons. And I'm so pleased to get to introduce our guest today to scholars and educators who have in their very different ways, pioneered wonderfully visionary and creative approaches to reading in and for community. Matthew Lee Anderson is a professor of ethics and theology at Baylor University's Institute for the Studies of Religion and the associate director of Baylor in Washington, as well as an associate fellow at the McDonald Center for Theology, Ethics, and Public Life at Oxford University. He's the founder of the web magazine, Mere Orthodoxy, the author of Earthen Vessels, Why Our Bodies Matter to Our Faith, and the end of our exploring, it is written widely for publications, including the Washington Post, Christianity Today, and many others. But he is also the founder and creator of 100 Days of Dante, the world's largest online reading group for the Divine Comedy, presented by Baylor University Honors College with support from at least five other uh, universities, which has hosted a communal reading group of many thousands that met for a hundred days starting this fall and commencing with Easter. Joining him is Dr. Anika Prather. Dr. Prather is an educator who served as a teacher, teacher supervisor, director of education, and head of school. She currently teaches classics at Howard University and is the founder of the Living Water School, a very unique classical school for independent learners. She's earned numerous graduate degrees in education, but maintains a research and practice focus on building literacy with African-American students through engagement with the books of the canon, which she articulates beautifully in her recently published work, Living in the Constellation of the Canon, the lived experiences of African-American students reading great books literature. Matt and Aniko, welcome. Thank you so, so much. much. I'm so excited. 
it's great to have you both here. So Matt, I want to start with you. What led you to start the world's largest Dante reading group of all of one's life uh, ambitions? This is an unusual one. And, and what did you hope to accomplish by facilitating a large communal reading of this classic rather than just encouraging people to read it on their own? Yeah, it was a crime of opportunity. It's certainly not the sort of thing that I ever imagined I would do when I was growing up. Um, and in fact, you know, Dante is a new love for me. I'm, I'm a Shakespeare guy. If I had to choose one, it would have been Shakespeare. But I was teaching in the Honors College here at Baylor, and I taught... Uh, with undergraduates all the way through the Divine Comedy. And it was such a phenomenal experience with my students. They, they resonated with the story in such a deep and profound way. Dante starts off the journey. He's lost in a dark wood. Uh, Virgil comes along, helps him get unlost, but he's got to go down through hell uh, in order to sort of encounter all the sins along the way and become the sort of person who's capable of then climbing Mount Purgatory and then ascending to see the face of God. It's this uh, extraordinary journey that he goes on. And students really resonated with it. And I thought that there was an opportunity to um, do something that would help others engage with the story like my students experienced it. It just so happened that as I was thinking about this, uh, I saw a, a tweet in which Pope Francis encouraged people to read uh, the Divine Comedy because it was the 750th anniversary of Dante's death. Mm. Uh, and so it seemed like the right time to put together this sort of reading group. Um, so, you know, we compiled 100 videos from teachers uh, from across the country and release them three times a week between September and Easter of this year and had, you know, some 15,000 people sign up to participate in this. And of course, um, not everyone finished, you know, it's a hard journey. We, we had probably about 3000 people make it with us to the end, but it was just a phenomenal experience for people who did it. Um, and, and yeah, it was, it was a terrific resource that we had a great time putting together. Sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, Anika, I want to ask you, you are a real pioneer in the, uh, the realm of uh, basically sort of research on, as well as the practice of the lived experience of African-American students in reading great books literature. And I'm sure you get this all the time, but there are many people who think, well, not only is, is this literature clearly not representative of, you know, of um, the students reading it, but inaccessible, potentially even oppressive. Mm. Um, so I'd love to hear from you why you lead your students through great books uh, and how do they respond by reading these books with each other? The most important thing for me to do to, to be successful at that was to first show it that it's relevant. And um, the easiest way for me to do that was to first see that it is it was relevant throughout black history it is an integral part of black history and 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 i started this journey though not realizing that i started this journey i had graduated from john's uh, st john's college my i was working in my parents classical school none of us really understood that it was a part of black history but we recognized that um, and i think my parents appreciated it because they read the canon when they were growing up in um uh, segregated schools. And so they had an appreciation for it that was just kind of natural. You just need to read this book. They didn't really have a philosophy behind it, but you're going to read Shakespeare. You're going to read C.S. Lewis. And it was really, but why, mommy? You're just going to read it. And so there was not a philosophy. So they created a school recognizing what this literature did for them, but not being able to really maybe articulate if the theory or the philosophy behind or why this is important. I think after my second year at St. John, I mean, yeah, St. John's, and my second year of teaching the Great Books class, where I would often use the arts to help the students engage, um, I just accidentally found an essay by Du Bois 
um, called Of the Training of Black Men. And at the end of the essay, this is the one where he says, I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not, you know, and he says, arm in arm with Balzac and Dumas, we glide in gilded halls. And then he says something like, you know, and they all come graciously with no scorn or condescension. And when I read that one line, they all come graciously with no scorn or condescension. A lot of times people read that passage and they think he's talking about, oh, you know, we, I can read the canon. I'm just as smart or smarter than you. But that's not what he's talking about. He's saying, do you not want us to feel this unity where we can all dance together in this ballroom? Because we're engaged with these thinkers of the past. For some reason, finding that essay made me think there's more like him somewhere. Mm-hmm. It just kind of, I would say, was the Lord. You know, he made me feel that by reading that passage for him. And then I looked at, and that made me look at the rest of the essays in Souls of Black Folk. And he is making a case throughout that book that this is the best education for Black people. That wasn't just that one essay. And I found a whole book of of the education, I think the education of black people, another collection of his education essays where he's saying the same thing. And I'm thinking if he's going through all of this to say, this is important, our people need to read this, there's something else missing. So I went on kind of like this Indiana Jones journey to discover, I mean, I literally ended up going through an abandoned school that was founded by Nanny Helen Burroughs with like, it was abandoned. And I found her class list, wow. Annie Helen Burrell's cast list. And one of the classes her class students had to take was Latin. So there's this journey I discovered. And then I discovered Frederick Douglass and it just Martin Luther King. And then before long, it was like, whoa, all of my ancestors are reading this stuff. And many of them were activists. They weren't oppressed. They weren't allowing themselves to be oppressed. They were freedom fighters. They weren't trying to assimilate. They were surviving, but they definitely used it to feed their activism. And so once I uncovered that, I began to teach it that way to my students. And that is what revolutionized my teaching it empowered them to know, ooh, Martin Luther King read this. Ooh, Black Panthers read this. You know, all types of Black activists read these works mm-hmm. and found um, liberation and, and fire to fight the good fight. And so they, they then kind of internalized that sense of purpose mm-hmm. and, and began to value it, which also allowed them to then value it just simply because but I had to start with their history first. Now, both of you are educators. And so I'd like to ask both of you, and we'll start with you, Matt. Uh, you chose difficult works, you know, uh, challenging works, but you also are doing this with others in community where this is not just a, a solo assignment. Uh, people are kind of reading collectively. What changes uh, educationally with the experience of reading in community rather than reading as a solitary act? Yeah, I think a lot changes. Um, In The City of God, Augustine talks about the way in which commonwealths are formed. And one way in which a commonwealth of people is formed is through a common object of love. When a group of people have something that they love that they share. And what happens when you gather around a text is you have something in common. And it doesn't matter what other differences are in the room, yeah. like the text is there and it's a, it's a meeting ground for everyone's yes. different perspectives. And as you talk together, your love for the text is intensified by other people's participation in it, yeah. by the way in which they read it, by the differences that you have, by the questions that they bring to the table that you didn't see together you intensify your love. In in, um, Reflections on the Psalms, C.S. Lewis talks about praise and how praise is the consummation of what you appreciate. Like if you go see a good movie, you feel this impulse to go tell someone about it. And I think that's right. But I think you could go a step farther and say what magnifies the delight even more is when you praise something and the person that you praise it to understands your praise 
and deepens it and returns it back to you. And when you have a community who reads a text, who sees something in it, who loves it together, like your praise and your delight and your enjoyment is magnified. It just grows and grows. So I think that's one of the central things that happens. I, just very briefly, I think one of the other things that happens is you just get like endurance. Like you get a reason to keep going through hard text. So many people who participated in 100 Days of Dante said that the reason they did it was because they had always wanted to read this text, but it was hard, it was foreign, they didn't know where to start. And there's something about reading it with other people that supplies a, just a reason to keep going because you might not experience something in the text, but you know you've got a book club that you've got to go to on Thursday night. You've got to say something. And if not, you know, like it's going to be a very dull book club. And so that sort of social pressure actually helps people gain the kind of endurance that they need to, to read things that are difficult that they wouldn't necessarily read otherwise. That's great. Can I connect to what he's just saying when he talked about that common ground? There's a there's a piece that I'm trying to finish writing that hopefully will get published someplace. Um, and it started with me watching a cartoon with my son. And the cartoon talked about the jungle and how there's kind of like this um, water truce where the animals of the jungle can't... Um, the predator, the predator can't go after the prey while they're drinking at the watering hole. That the watering hole is a neutral ground of peace when they're there and it's safe, which is a myth. It's, that doesn't really work like that. A lion is going to eat you at the watering hole. But in, uh, but I just kind of when I watched it, my husband knew that I was going to go someplace with that. He's like, "You're going to connect that to what you're doing, aren't you?" I said, "You darn tootin." <laughs> and I found out that that concept, though, was from um, Rudyard Kipling's second jungle book. There's this whole uh, listing of the laws of the jungle. And part of those laws is this water truce, because every living creature has to have water. And if if the prey doesn't drink water, then they die off and the predator has no food. So there's this mutual respect that we all need water to survive. And so I, um, it can, it, for some reason, it made me think of the canon mm. because our, all of our ancestors have read the works of the canon. And this, there's a pattern that I see in, a, in many of the African-American or Black um, uh, activists, authors, influencers, history makers, one thing I see that's very common, Martin Luther King will be a prime example, I'll say, Frederick Douglass too, is when they read it, they didn't read it. There are some who did this, but they didn't read it to say, I'm smarter than you and I'm better than you and I'm separating myself from you and I don't need you. Many of them read it and wanted to build a bridge to those who used to oppress them or at one time oppress them. There was this activism that involved a creation of unity. So the, the, the one who created I Have a Dream says the canon influenced the work of the civil rights movement. Frederick Douglass did not run off to Canada and live happily ever after. He remains here in the United States and partners with people who do not look like him, who also were reading the canon to, to fight this fight of not just ending slavery and oppression, but also bringing healing and unity amongst the races. So you see this common pattern, I only listed two. So you see that common, and so that connects me to this concept of the water truce, this canon being a space of mutual refreshing of everybody, no matter what shade of skin you have. And then also a place of common ground, as you said, Matthew, where we all can gather around these stories that tell the human story. And there's a quote by James Baldwin that really connects with what I'm saying, that he says, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. It was books that taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive or who had ever been alive. And the canon has served that for humanity throughout the centuries. That's beautiful. So I, I'm curious, uh, I'd like to ask both of you this as well. You know, you're both educators and part of your job at different levels are teaching your students to read well. 
you know, and of course, reading well is, uh, it's a skill that has to be developed. And it's quite different from the way we read so much of the material we come across in any given day, where we're sort of doing a quick scan, a sort of strip mining of data from a text. Uh, you know, reading well involves kind of deep immersion and interrogation of the text and the like. And I'm curious uh, what it means to read well in community. You know, do any of the skills or the approaches change? And uh, Matt, maybe you can start us off there. Yeah, it's a really good question. I've got a, a friend, Tom Ward, who talks about uh, reading well as cracking your head on a book. Like you spend so much of your, t- of your time. It seems violent. But... Yeah, it's a little <laughs> violent, image, but, it's, but I love it because you spend so much of your time trying to get this text into your head and your head is, is a kind of thick thing sometimes and you've got to crack your head on it. Like it's got to, it's got to sort of make its way into you. And that just takes time. Um, you know, one of the things that I would do when I was a, an undergraduate in a discussion class, but I, I, I would multitask, essentially, I would spend time listening to other people's comments about the text while also looking through the text concurrently to remind myself of what the text said. Because the, the, the fact of the text being a common ground where we're meeting together, like that only works if we're willing to return to the source, you know, to go back to the water, to use Anika's image over and over and over again. And so I think that what reading well looks like in community is the willingness to constantly return to that source and to bring it forward as a gift and an offering to the rest of the conversation to say, here is in the text where I saw this thing. Let us now read it together. And so when I teach undergraduates, I just, I, they, they get so tired of me saying over and over, and where precisely in the text did you <laughs> see that? Because, you know, they'll make these claims yes. about the text yes. and they might be right, but the only way in which we're going to know whether they're right is if they will take us to the thing we have in yes. common and yes. show it to us. And so they've yes. got to know the text well, they've got to be immersed in it, but they've got to use the text in such a way that it is a common property for the community. So I think that's that's one of the biggest thing that changes. Yeah, I think, um, I, I feel like Aristotle was a good example for me. And I came to like Aristotle after hating Aristotle at St. John's College. And, <laughs> but um, what made me switch from hating him is somehow parts of animals really allowed me to see his process of inquiry and just constantly asking questions. The question is almost being a shovel that's digging you down deep over and over. So it goes beyond just the students, and I'm talking more about K-12, but I think this can apply to college students and beyond and adults. Um, It's more than just someone regurgitating back to you what they think the story or the text is about. But then you're beyond that, you're you're encouraging them to, well, what questions do you have? What are some things you're curious about Mm -hmm. from this text? A lot of times when I came to St. John's College, I was very nervous because I was so used to being right. I have to make sure that when with the, if the tutor or the professor asks me a question, that I give an answer that is more right than everyone else at the table. But I soon learned after probably a week at St. John's, that that's not why we're here. We're all here, the tutor included, who may have read the book a million times to learn, to ask questions, to be open to other ways of seeing what this text is talking about. And so I think reading well involves knowing how and not being afraid of asking questions. Yeah. Can I just- And being, yeah. Go ahead. No, I love that so much. I think that's exactly right. I mean, one of the things that I, when we did the 100 Days of Dante project, we provided questions for people about every canto. And I was initially opposed to the idea. Um, We did it because it's a fairly common thing for a reading group to do. and And it gets a conversation started where you might struggle to start a conversation otherwise. But one of the things that I tell my students is it's much more important to ask the questions that you have. Yes. And yes. to start there. 
and to have the courage to start with questions that you might think are very obvious questions about the text, because often those are very difficult questions to answer. Yeah. And there's a sense when, when people get together that they, there is this pressure that you've got to ask the right questions about the text. Yes. And, you know, and that, that pressure is really counterproductive to yes. a meaningful experience with the, with the text. You really have to do what Anika did have the courage to ask the questions that you yeah. have to whatever yeah. they are to, yeah. you can only start from where you are. Yeah. And, and it's and not being afraid to say, I don't understand. Can someone explain this line to me? Or I'm not sure I understand what this word means or, and, and that opens up a beautiful discussion and a place of discovery too. When you are, hum it's a humble thing, I think, you know, and I, there's a quote from Socrates that he says um, something about, you know, Wisdom begins in wonder. Like wisdom is not saying I know it all. Wisdom is is acknowledging I don't know much, you know, and I'm I want to learn, and I'm going to learn through asking these questions and and finding out what other people think as well. Yeah. So we're at a time when reading in general is in decline. Um, you know, there's been a slight uptick in the last couple of years just because we've all been home with the pandemic. But, you know, in general, we are reading less, we're comprehending what we read less, we're reading great literature and the great books less, we're reading in community less. Uh, and the, those that decline is not all even, it's uh, steepest among boys and those uh, most at risk. And would love to kind of hear from both of you and Anika, maybe we can start with you, what the implications are um, I, I wish I could say that there were there were different trends among Christians, uh, but those of us who who worship the word are not necessarily reading uh, the word much. Oh, oh, she said that. Yes. What, what happens? <laughs> what happens um, to us as a, a community, as a as a country, when we read? When we I. I, I cringed when you said many of us who are basically saying we're students of the word are not really reading the word. That's, that's very deep, you know, that we, we, we go to church, we know a few scriptures, but we think we understand the mind of Christ with, with how to relate in this world. Um, and I think, I think to your point, I think this is probably why I have become even more passionate about classical education because I see schools, I hope this is answering your question. It's kind of in a roundabout way, but this is why I, I, I see schools as factories for building readers or non-readers. And so when we have a school that is so focused on just fill in the blank, pass the test, fill in the bubble so we can get these high test scores and there is no thinking, no critical thinking, no questioning, no wondering, no inquiry-based learning, um, we continue to create people that honestly go out into the world, no matter what, and I'm saying this to all races, I'm not saying this at a particular race, as all of us are guilty of this, of being people who don't help the healing process with racial healing. Because we're stuck in our caves, right? We're stuck thinking that these shadows that are dancing on the wall in the cave are what reality is, instead of actually picking up a primary source document, a primary source book that gives us understanding of what really is. Then taking that knowledge and trying to unchain the rest of those and bringing them out into the light. But because we are not reading, we are not equipped to do that. And so we're in this vicious cycle um, of no one listening to each other, constant judgment, constant, like if you say one thing, the person you're talking to is interpreting it as meaning one thing and they don't even know what your heart is. The beauty about reading though, reading well and, and as teachers, whether you're in K-12 or even university level, the importance of having these classes that teach people to read well is it begins to chisel away at that stone that blocks the cave door. <laughs> it begins, to, it's some, because you become face to face with someone most likely who has passed on and they're sharing in this space. They have no idea who you are. They're not writing against you specifically necessarily. They're just writing this human narrative that they've experienced. And you find yourself there being able to identify. And then you, Sherry, may come with me and we're reading the same thing. And you're like, 
well, this is what I'm thinking about this same book. And before long, you're having this conversation between two people that may be politically disconnected, racially disconnected, gender disconnected, disconnected on so many different ways. But we find a connection in reading well this text. And so I think um, I, I really place a big responsibility on schools, educators, fixing. We're, I, I see us as activists and, and creating more activists who will shake things up a little bit by reading well and, and, and inviting the world to see things differently. Yeah, I think that's really right. I mean, one of the there's so much that can be said here, and it's such a hard question, Sheree. The, a few years ago, I quit Netflix, um, and I quit streaming television in my home. I just said, no more movies, no more television in my home, because I wanted to read more. That was one of the main mm. motivations. Mm. And one of the reasons why I did that was because it seemed to me that many of the shows that had once marked the cultural landscape in America we're being forgotten very, very quickly. Lost is, you know, the last show that was on network television, not HBO or something like that, that probably had widespread cultural yep. salience or cachet. And I, like the students that I teach in college have no clue what Lost is. They don't care at all. And no one in public discourse, it just doesn't matter. It's so ephemeral. And I think what happens when you, lose a culture of reading is everything becomes ephemeral and everything is forgotten very, very quickly. And that has knock on effects on our public discourse on, yes. you know, it's, it's, I think contributes to a, a certain sort of polarization. Yes. Um, but I think what I'm concerned about is it has really substantive effects on our souls that there's a kind of shallowness and a hollowing out of our persons that goes along with that. There's, there's a unique cognitive burden that comes with sitting down and reading a book that's 350 pages. I love like serialized television. You know, I, I get its appeals. It's very attractive, but reading, you know, I'm, I've been spending the last three years reading Trollope like a maniac you know, reading a 400-page trollop novel is a different type of cognitive experience. And it's the sort of cognitive experience that is demanding in a way in which screens, TVs, et cetera, are not demanding. And I think that there's, there's hopefully a kind of depth that comes with that and a, a culture, sense of memory mm -hmm. that... Uh, you lose if you don't have a culture of reading and it's just extremely bad it's it's like i you know my understanding is that uh at a private gathering a ceo of a major hollywood film studio when asked what the future of hollywood movies were answered tiktok wow and so it's, it's, to me, this is one of the gravest social crises uh, that we have. And we, we need more than anything, real practices of resistance, real communities who are going to read together to keep alive intellectual habits that, mm -hmm. that will be lost otherwise. And to, resist the kind of social fragmentation and decay that come with the loss of those habits. And, and I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, but to, and to that point that in our reading, this, and we're all fans of the canon, that we are reading the diverse voices who also read the canon. That's another really yeah. key point. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we can even venture to say that when we go back to reading well, those who did use, because that, that does exist, there are people who have used the canon, the Bible, for oppressive means. That is there. But that was not what was necessarily in the text itself. Um, even, even assuming that, oh, um, I, I think I even heard a scholar say, no one else besides these authors have really written anything that have really touched humanity, you know? And so it's important to read Gandhi. It's important to read MLK and James Baldwin and Du Bois and Douglas and 
honestly, Ta-Nehisi Coates. It's really important to read these people who have read the canon because they have something to say that does offer another worldview. Because if we don't include these, this is, this is the beauty of the canon. Everyone has read them. Like just to be, just to be, this is kind of a lighthearted proof. I went to Hawaii a month ago for my anniversary, right? So we're touring the castle of the Hawaiian, the last Hawaiian king and queen or what have you. And they're taking on us on a tour. I'm just thinking, I'm just here in the beautiful Hawaii. I'm just going to enjoy this little bit of, you know, Hawaiian history. And they were reading the canon before they were colonized. The kings and queens would get in, you know, they would travel to European countries and come back with these books and create libraries on the island. And they, and because they wanted to engage as, as people from other countries would come who may have read the same thing and they were reading in community. They were reading because they wanted to share in this shared heritage was what I like to call it. And so we need to be telling those stories and learning more about these other people that don't all look the same, who also read the canon and wrote about those experiences and how they made connections to it. And that also, can, that that is what allows the world to see that these books are not just for one group of people and invites more people to the conversation. I want to get to questions. There's so many of them piling up. But before we do, I want to ask just real briefly about those um, patterns of resistance that you mentioned, that, which is, you know, there is, uh, I think, a human yearning, you know, to to read and to read with others and for the relationships that are are found there. And you know, there have been times poetry used to be all out loud; it became academic. Um, but there was a fresh expression, a rap, you know, in many ways, or just spoken word. Um, and I'm curious what each of you see as the future of communal reading. Um, you both have pioneered sort of a fresh expression of that. Um, what hope do you see uh, for the future of reading in community? Matt, maybe we can start with you. Uh, I, I see hope in Anika's school and <laughs> in the Baylor University Honors College and in the Trinity Forum, right? Like in one sense, the future of reading is the same as the past of reading. It's just more intense and more amplified and there's more intentionality around it because if you're not intentional about it all of the cultural pressures will eliminate reading from your life and so organizations like the trinity forum that do book clubs and that provide guides and that help people read more are un unbelievably essential for creating communities that do resist so i i like in a Sheree didn't ask me to say that, but it's genuinely the truth. Um, and so like those sort of organizations, schools like Anika's, they need genuine support and resources yes, to Lord do Jesus. more and good work to yeah. form people to read well. It's, it's yeah. absolutely imperative. I mean, and then that's, I, I think you're expressing my heart. I think that's what my passion is, is, um, encouraging those who would normally have the invitation to read well, yeah, to yeah. join the conversation. I don't, I'm not interested in a segregated experience. Mm -hmm. I, I am interested in inviting everyone to this space where all shades of people are reading well together. And I'm inviting it, you know, and, and I'm inviting everyone to that conversation. And it is imperative that we all do that. Um, and I, I really feel uh, my journey also began when my husband was teasing me. I was telling him my frustration about the, just the racial tension we see around us. And years ago, I said, you know, I think we could just solve all of this if we all just sat together and read a great book together. And at the time, he said, really, sweetie? And he's he's an engineer. <laughs> he's a reader, too. We both are love to read together. And, and he writes poetry and everything. But he just thought that didn't make sense. He said, now I'm starting to kind of think you're right. Now that was, you know, now he's starting to feel that way. It seems very simple to me. You know, we're doing so much of watching the news and trying to digest and articulate what everybody, every newscaster is saying and every social media post is saying, where if we all just picked up a book of those who've lived this before and talked about our experiences and got to know each other from that place of grace, we could accomplish so much together. But it can only work if those who are doing it are diverse. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. 
Well, the questions are piling up. And so I'm going to combine a couple of questions um, and I might toss these to, uh, to you, Aniko. I have a question from Lisey uh, Barnett who asked, in reading together, is it helpful to have participants read aloud or is it better to have people read it? individually and then discuss it. And kind of a similar sort of tactical question from Jenny Savage who asked, what resources would either of our presenters recommend for those who need help in learning to read the text closely and well? So we'll start with you, Anika, and then uh, Matt, maybe you can chime in. The first thing is um, it de that question can only be answered by first understanding what your students, no matter how old they are, their background is. So for me, I often, um, I have a mix, but I do have often, all the time have students who don't come from families that read or are definitely not interested in reading these, these texts. Um, and reading is not something that's enjoyable. So I um, take advice from Charlotte Mason who says, don't try not to do abridged versions or watered down, watered down versions, but take their actual primary text, but give it to them in bite sizes and let them read it that way. And so there are a couple of companies that I like for that. Um, one, my favorite is Touch Tones. You can find them. It's called the Touch Tones Discussion Project. And what the, he does, and he's, a, I think, the founder of this, Howard, I can't remember his last name, but um, he takes excerpts from pieces of the canon, works of the canon, and he's made a whole curriculum around it, anthologies for every age group from the little kids, little kids, like kindergarten, first, second, third grade, all the way up to adult. These programs have been used in jails. They have been used in marginalized communities to, to introduce them to reading well, because it has a teacher's guide and it has the anthology for each student. And um, you read this and you discuss it, which leads them to being able to read longer texts eventually as they, instead of just plopping down Hobbes Leviathan in front of us, that will make them run for the hills. But if you start off with little bite sizes of the actual text and engage in the, the Touchstones discussion project has the questions that you can ask and you can find it on the website, get class sets. It's wonderful. Tell them Anika sent you. And, um, and that's a great place to start. I also like Junior Great Books, which comes out of the Great Books um, organization. Um, I said them second because um, they've become very contemporary. So they've mixed in a lot of more contemporary works. And I'm very much very traditional when it comes to the canon, um, which I know frustrates people sometimes. I'm sorry. But um, I just want to read the text that Martin Luther King read and Du Bois read and all of, all of my heroes read and Anna Julia Cooper. So I stick with that, but um, Great Books does have quite a few pieces of text, but also some very well-written modern text that would also foster a really great conversation as well, but in smaller bite size, a little bit longer than touch tones, but definitely bite size. And then finally, graduating to, let's read a book a quarter. Let's read a book a quarter, eventually getting to let's read a book a month. Um, and, and then that kind of gives you an example of how we're weaning those who didn't normally read this way or are not from environments that read this way, how to wean them in. And you will find that they do get drawn in. They love the intellectual conversation. Um, and it makes them feel really good about themselves. And then they all begin to see the world differently. They do feel like they've gained access to another perspective on the world around them. Yeah. Matt, I'm gonna ladle another question on top of that one. So you, maybe you can combine both. There's a question from Heather Zeger who asked, can you talk about the value of rereading and especially how you talk to your students about the value of rereading a book? <laughs> Yeah, I love that question. I mean, the best resource for reading a text is rereading the text. Um, <laughs> you know, one of my teachers and friends, Fred Sanders, has said that it's not so much what you should get out of a text that matters, but what you can get out of it. And part of the value of rereading a text is your capacity for getting more out of the text increases. Uh, you know, if you get 15% out of a book like The Divine Comedy. That's phenomenal. That's 15% of extraordinarily thoughtful work. When you go back and reread it, you might get 25% out, right? 30%, et cetera. And 
like knowledge of a text is compounding. So again, I mentioned I'm a Shakespeare guy. One thing that I do is in, in terms of how I help people read through Shakespeare is I encourage them to pick one text and to live with it mm. for a long time. Yes. And to read it and reread it and reread it and then to branch out because what you'll discover is other plays generally have something to do it's, with the one text that you know. So yes. Midsummer Night's Dream, I think, is the, the perfect starting place yes. for the knowledge of Shakespeare. Yes. Knowing Midsummer Night's Dream inside and out allows people to then build on that as they go to other plays and hear themes and resonances. But if you know one text really well, you can mm -hmm. do that. And so that's that's what rereading a text gives us. It gives us yeah. deep familiarity with one place and it allows for connections as we read other texts. And that increases our pleasure of both texts. Yeah. But if you only have read one text very shallowly, it's hard to get that sense of pleasure. Yep, that's great. So our next question, and I'll direct this to you, Anika, comes from David Chestnut, who asks, why is the decline in reading books greater among men? I lead a group, uh, a book club for young physicians in training, and the women participants outnumber the men by five to one. I mean, I think we're living, and to back up a little bit, I used to think this issue with the reading was only relegated to the black community. That was where my heart was that, and that's where it will always be. And that's where I saw the greatest concern, black communities, schools located in black neighborhoods. I saw this. Then I started teaching at the college level at all types of universities, black, white, HBCUs, non HBCUs. And it was the same pervasive problem. Like if I was at a predominantly white institution, I would still get students like, I don't like reading. Do I have to read all of that? And I'm, I'm only giving a few pages. Why is that? I think, especially with men, um, I think overall the society has just come to a place of fill in the blank and let's, let's get the job, right? So when we think about men, as much as we may think we, we're a more feminist society, and, the, and I'm, not a, I'm not a feminist in the, in the, in the non-Christian sense, but as much as we think so, we're still very much a patriarchal society where the man gets a good job, provides for his family, provides for his life and makes a good life for himself, right? And gets that job. I think all of society has gotten to a place, especially with men, where they're just so focused on getting the job. And we see that, especially with, there seems to be this competition, which often is a male dominated field with STEM. There's this competition with STEM professions competing with humanities professions, right? And so, and those, those professions, and I see this at the university level, those students who are in those STEM professions, often male, don't, have not experienced the importance of reading and reading well, but they can work that science and that math problem, and they can figure out that STEM issue, but just enjoying reading, um, and reading well may not be happening. And somehow STEM fields can be presented as if the, the humanities are not important. So I think we have to get to a place where we recognize that the both are equally important and related. Um, uh, and that, I, and, and again, I keep talking about St. John's, I'm not, they're not paying me to talk about them at all. I don't even know if they know I'm doing this program today, but St. John's, there are so many STEM professionals that come out of St. John's. And I'm an example. I hated math and science until I went to St. John's and took the math science segment because you understand how math and science uh, is a literature, is another kind of literacy as well that also tells a story. So I think, I mean, that's my guess is this, the field of study that a lot of men go into, it seems to be related to that, but that's a guess. <laughs> Matt, anything to add? No, I think it's a fascinating question and I'd honestly like to do more work on it. I think what Anika says about the STEM just, you know, imbalances in that sort of realm is right. One of the reasons why I love Baylor is when I teach great text classes, you know, uh, I actually teach a lot of the engineering and science students um, who many of whom take literature classes as, as a part of their 
engineering type of training? I mean, it's, yeah. So it's a very interesting question. Um, yeah. That I need to do a lot more work on. Yeah. And I, and, but to that point, and we saw this is why the Howard University students were fighting to save the classics department when it was going through that. Yeah. And many of the students, the, some, they wrote letters. These were STEM students. They had come to see the value of classics, even though they were STEM. And they wrote these beautiful papers on how it, the STEM connected with classics helped them understand humanity even better. But we are, we're in a society that now that seems to be trying to disconnect that relationship. Yeah. So our next question comes from Jasmine Ganter. And Jasmine asks, can you speak to the microcosm of family as a testing ground for reading in community? Uh, Matt, I'll toss that one to you. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, one of the things that was most delightful to us who ran 100 Days of Dante on our team was seeing the Instagram posts of families reading Dante together. You know, obviously it's not age appropriate for everyone, but we had a lot of families with eight, nine, 10 year olds who were working their way through the divine comedy with their parents and experiencing it. And it was delightful to see. I mean, the, there's, there's a, again, it's a, it's a kind of commonality, right? There's a common experience that a text provides for a people and a family who reads together has something in common that goes beyond mm -hmm. their shared history as this particular people, right? Like it, it, as, you know, we descended from our grandparents and our great grandparents, et cetera. all that's very important. But what a book in common does is it, is it actually expands the horizon beyond the family itself and it introduces other types of experiences, other types of perspectives yeah. in a mediated way into the family. And it allows the family to incorporate those other types of experiences into its own common living and understanding of the world. And so I think reading together as a family is just massively important. Um, I also think like reading scripture together as a family yes, yes. is... Um, you know, there's, there's, if you want commonality and if you want a deep understanding of the world that we lived in, that we live in now, it's impossible without scripture uh, yes. and without a deep understanding of the text and, uh, you know, doing that as a family and having that be a pervasive part of your culture, not so that everyone can sort of go around and judge each other by throwing the latest, you know, the Bible verse of the day at each other, which is yeah. not a healthy family experience. <laughs> so that you have a, a common language, a common discourse, and one which is saturated with the, the yes. word of God, I think is yes. actually a really valuable thing to do yes. with a family. Yes. So I want to combine two questions for our final question, which I'll uh, ask both of you to tackle. Maybe we'll start with you, Anika. Uh, Linda Boast asks, is reading well synonymous with reading closely? And relatedly, an anonymous viewer, can you speak to how someone becomes a good reader? What are some of the habits that one needs to cultivate in order to read more and read well? <sighs> okay. That's, that question has always been, it's a hard question to answer because it can almost feel very nebulous and it doesn't have a, a set formula. So I think, let me, let, me, let me do the first part, reading closely and reading well. I think you can, I think if you're not asking questions, you can do one without the other. Like if you're just reading closely, meaning you're reading it to yourself and you're seeing how it connects to your life and what it all means to you, you can, I think you can do that reading closely. I think reading well, though, involves the questioning and the engagement. I feel like that is a piece of it. And I think it does connect what we were just talking about, reading with family, reading in community, reading the word together. I grew up reading the word with my mom and dad. We had to read scripture before we came down for breakfast. And my mom, my dad, my brother and I would sit around the table and talk about what is this saying to me and ask questions. And we still do that today as a family. Um, 
And so it's that engagement and that sense of community. And so it's not just connecting it to yourself and finding joy in it on yourself kind of uh, in a vacuum, but it is asking questions and talking to someone else about it and, and being able to articulate that um, with each other um, back and forth. So, I, and, and how that is taught, again, I know it's not like a broken record, is Socratic dialogue. I mean, the seminar model is just such an exercise of reading well and, and training children and students and adults how to read well is engaging in that back and forth, that Socratic dialogue with each other. Yeah, those are great questions. So I think I'm going to say no, that reading well doesn't require, always require reading closely. It certainly does in some contexts, but there are other contexts where reading well just means reading. I, um, you know, I read probably at least 20 minutes. Sometimes it goes up to 40 every night before I go to bed. And, you know, I'm just lying in bed. I've got my little book light going and I'm, I'm reading away. And at that particular juncture of my life, I do not want to be thinking. Thinking is the thing that I'm opposed to. And so like reading P.G. Wodehouse, the early 20th century British writer, is the perfect palate cleanser for a day because there's, you can't have a deep thought reading P.G. Wodehouse. It's just, it's against the grain of the whole experience. Um, and so I'm, I'm reading it literally to turn my mind off um, and to have a few good laughs. And it's been terrific for mental health purposes. I've, I've uh, given this out to many people who have struggled uh, with mental health because it's just a great reading experience. Now that's a particular type of reading. Um, and it's not the sort of reading that I would commend in every context or in every way. And in fact, if all I ever did was read P.G. Wodehouse, I'd think there'd be something deficient in my soul, <laughs> um, which relates to how we can become a good reader. The second question, I think one of the things that I want to do is lower the pressure or the sense of anxiety about being a good, good reader and say, it's more important to be just become a reader first. And so blocking out distractions, carving out time for it, um, saying no to other forms of entertainment and taking up books as a part of one's life is much more important as a first step to become a good reader. The other thing I'd say is that you really do have to balance your enjoyment and the challenges that you're willing to take on. Um, at some points, it's important to read for enjoyment like P.G. Wodehouse. At other points, you got to challenge yourself because the only way in which you're going to become a good reader is by reading things that you're not good at reading when you start. Uh, it's like music. The only way you're going to become good at listening to music is by hearing some things and thinking, I just didn't understand that. Like, did also didn't appreciate it, didn't enjoy yeah. it, but definitely didn't understand it. And those sorts of moments, yes. if you can find yourself having that sort of experience, feeling a little lost with a text, that's actually a great yes. Because what that will do is it will prompt you to get yourself a little unlost. You might go look up someone who could help to find a guide, to find a Virgil who will come and show you the way. And as you do that, you'll grow in your appreciation for that particular text and your capacity to be a good reader in general will go up. So I think having experiences where you feel lost and overwhelmed and where you don't like text is really important. Like the Brothers Karamazov is a great test case for your reading. If you, if you make it through Father Zosima's really long, really, really long speech, in the first third of the book, right? You will have a transformative experience, but the number of people who quit the Brothers Karamazov 200 pages in because they get bogged down in this super long speech on love is just enormous. So take that up as a, as a good litmus test for a challenging book to get through. I think, that's, I think that's one of my challenges with what you're saying is getting students, young and old, to be that conscious to me that's yeah. that's that's some good reading when you can acknowledge i don't understand this because i've i i have met students who they they're given the reading assignment they say i read it i'm finished 
but they can't tell you what they read. They can't give you an opinion on it. They don't even, they can't even come up with a question, but somehow they're thinking because they sat and looked at the words and decoded some words that they have read. I I like what you said there because even Mm -hmm. teaching students to be just conscious, you know, um, of what they're reading and how they feel about it. Um, is is also people would be surprised yeah. that that's that's some good reading to me because you're being conscious as opposed to just drudging through it just to say you read it or yeah. to say oh I read that book and you don't even know what it means because sometimes people are in reading competitions they like mm-hmm. they like saying I, I love to read I, I'm reading this book and they sit there with their book and it's all big and thick and they're reading and if you ask them questions or try to engage they can't. Mm-hmm. Um, but the consciousness that happens in reading, whether it's for entertainment or not, yeah. too, is just is something I really want to try to inspire in students. I definitely never did that. I never carried a big book around that I wasn't really reading. That was never me when I was in high school. <laughs> not at all. Matt and Nika, this has been uh, a real delight. And in just a moment, I'm going to give you a very short last word of a sentence or two. Before we do that, a few things just to let everyone know. First, right as we conclude, there'll be a survey form available. We really do appreciate your feedback. We read all of these. And as a special incentive for filling out that feedback form, we will send you a code for a free Trinity form reading of your choice. I have titles on many of the, with many of the authors and uh, topics mentioned here, including Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail, uh, of course, the Divine Comedy and several others. So hope that you will avail yourself of that. In addition, tomorrow for everyone who registered, we'll be sending around an email with a video link, uh, which includes the edited video from today's conversation, which we hope that you'll share with others. There'll be a bunch of readings and resources to help one go more deeply. Uh, And if one is a visual person, we also want to just say thanks to Bruce Van Patter, who will be coming up with an illustrated uh, image, kind of summarizing and synthesizing today's conversation. So that will be posted on Facebook uh, in in the next uh, few days. For those of you who signed up to participate in our post-online conversation discussion groups, uh, they will be happening almost immediately afterwards. Just exit as you normally would and log on to the link that you have been sent. I also want to make a a really sort of special announcement. We've been talking about reading and the future of communal reading and and speaking of reading groups, just to let everyone know this is perhaps more of a pre-announcement of a new initiative that we are going to, we at the Trinity Forum will be undertaking later this summer where we hope to launch reading groups and a reading group movement. And so if you are someone who's interested In being a reading group leader, uh, we will have different resources. We will have a book club box that is essentially a do-it-yourself kit to get started. Uh, And want to make sure you know about the link in the chat feature if you are interested in that. Would love for you to sign up. Uh, It will be a couple more months before we'll we're fully uh, announced, but we would love to be in touch with you about your, your interest in that uh, and hope that you all watching will be part of this movement. In addition, I wanted to invite everyone watching to join the Trinity Forum Society, which is the community of people who help make the mission of the Trinity Forum uh, to promote, cultivate, and curate the best of Christian thought leadership possible. There are many benefits to becoming a member, including a subscription to our quarterly readings, our daily list of what we're reading, uh, reading recommendations, and as a special incentive for doing so with your membership or your gift of $100 or more, we will send you a custom collection of readings based on the topics we've covered, which will include the Divine Comedy, excerpts from the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, as well as Dorothy Sayers' The Lost Tools of Learning. Our next online conversation will be on June 24th. We're delighted to host Kurt Thompson and Jeffrey Judiak on neurobiology and the soul. So there will be a link in the chat feature. Hope you can join us for that. And finally, as promised, I wanna give the last word to Matt and Anika. Matt. 
Well, not to put too much of a downer on it, but I, I thought about one dangerous communal reading experience from the Divine Comedy in Canto Five of the Inferno. Paolo and Francesca, in one of the most famous scenes, uh, describe how they read together the story of Lancelot and Guinevere. And uh, as the text says, at the moment when... Uh, 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 Lancelot quist, kissed Guinevere. They looked at each other and they read no more that day, which is a delightful moment in the Divine Comedy, but it's also a caution about mm. being together and the types of explosive, dangerous things that texts can do to us and for us. And so I think it's, it's uh, an extraordinary adventure learning but it's also a dangerous one and it's one that needs to be undertaken with great caution and wisdom and which is why we need organizations again not a like forced plug like the trinity forum to help guide us through the world of reading and text thanks for that and I want to close out. I was reading some of the Q&A and I want to make sure I'm clear on what I was saying about STEM. I wasn't talking about students, but I was talking about there is a mentality in academia, in the career field, that there is a separation between STEM and humanities, that we are constantly battling. There are universities across the nation that are closing down humanities, lessening the requirement for humanities in order to usher in more STEM programs when I'm a firm believer that you need both. I use Dr. Fauci as a good example, who was a man of the humanities, but also was in STEM. And so, and I think that little example is an example of a larger thing that Everyone thinks it's compartmentalized. What I love about the canon, which is basically the books, books rooted in ancient Greece and Rome and those ancient texts and authors who have come out from that are the canon. They find themselves rooted back into those old ancient works and then they write going forward. What I have found as we all are going through life and thinking, this is humanities, this is STEM, this is black, this is white, this is Christian, this is not, this is good, this is bad, that the canon is our common ground. It is our shared heritage. No matter what color you are, what country you're from, what you're studying to be, what your career choice is, it is relevant to every human being. And the more of us who believe that shout it from the mountaintops, the more we can draw people into this water truce where we come together around the refreshing works of classics and the canon. Anika, Matt, this has been a real delight. Thank you so yeah. much. Thanks, Sri. Thank, Thank you. you. Each of you for joining us. Have a great weekend. <laughs>